Thank you. My name is Kenning Arlich. I'm the Dean of the Library at Montana State University. And until a year ago, I was Associate Dean for IT Services up at um, University of Utah, just up on the hill. So uh, what I'd like to talk to you today about is search engine optimization and why it should matter to library leaders. There, there is a, a much stronger uh, leadership slash management connection than I originally anticipated when I started this research back in 2010. Um, I thought SEO was going to be purely a, a technical problem, but it's not. It's a technical, the technical IT aspects of SEO are actually a minority of the, of the issue. Um, and I'll, I'll get into more detail about why that is. I do want to acknowledge my co-researcher, uh, Patrick O'Brien, who actually lives here in uh, Park City. Um, Patrick and I um, won a, were awarded an IMLS grant in 2011 for three years, so we are now on the third year of that grant, and he's fully funded on the grant, and so he travels up about once a month to Bozeman for a week at a time, and. Um, works with my team there. Um, so this has been sort of the, the guiding principle of our work. Uh, this quote from Ann Peterson Bishop, um, we cannot call a digital library or electronic publishing system a success if we cannot measure and interpret its use. So it, it's, it's a lot about assessment. So here's what we're going to talk about, uh, just agenda-wise, three, three separate areas, the strategic value of search engine optimization, our SEO analytics uh, research study, the specifics of, of what we have found, and then sort of a next phase. Because when I think about SEO, I think about it in, in two phases. There's the traditional SEO aspect, which we, we dealt with for the first couple of years. And now we're moving into what we call uh, semantic web research, which is, is exciting. And, uh, on its own merits. So why should you care about SEO? Um, I think when we started this research, you know, the, the, the response that we got from a lot of people is, well, that's, that's an IT problem. You lead the IT group, so you, know, you guys deal with it. And that's partially true, but it's, there's a lot, there are many more stakeholders and many more people who should be responsible for search engine optimization um, than just the IT group. And in fact, you don't want just the IT group uh, to deal with this. Um, back up for a second. How many, how many people are here from academic libraries? And publics? And special? Anyone I missed? Of those academic uh, libraries, how many would you would consider themselves to be from uh, research libraries? Thank you. I think there's, there's value in this for, for all of you, um, but a lot of what we've been focused on is uh, special collections, digitization, as well as institutional repositories, um, and, and so the, the, the academic and research side of that. But the, the real reason for, the, the real overall reason for SEO is that As we build, as we have been building digital libraries, we have been doing that with um, funding sources from a variety of places, m many times from grant funding resources. And for the first, I don't know, five or 10 years, grant funders like IMLS, like LSTA, NEH, we're handing money to libraries to digitize certain collections based on the merits of those collections. And they had evaluation requirements, but they really didn't go to the level of, is the digitization of this collection really being effective? Are you really reaching users, and are users really using those collections? And so now, in the, in the last few years, Funders like IMLS have been getting much more serious about wanting to know this. Is our money being well spent? Um, and it's not just funding agencies, it's uh, state legislatures as well. They're looking in general more from a return on investment uh, uh, equation from um, academic libraries and, and universities in general. And state legislatures, of course, are funded by local taxpayers. 
Montana State University is a land-grant institution, um, which means that we have an explicit mission to serve the community at large, um, not only to educate, but to, to, to communicate and, and engage a lot with uh, local communities. And so we feel that there's a real need, for instance, to make the research of Montana State University accessible to that public. Um, University of Administration, of course, is where most of our funding comes from, and they want to know, is this money being well spent? Uh, you know, we've heard about this for a while with um, collection, collections themselves, journal subscriptions, database subscriptions. Um, how, do they, how do we justify that? But it's moving into this area of justifying digital collections uh, as well. And then donors, of course. And in fact, this was one of the the real imperatives that started our research at the University of Utah. We had donors who had given collections to our special collections department. Special collections had scanned those materials and put them up on the web and donors were going to Google and saying, where is it? Can't find it. Uh, and they were then calling Greg Thompson and, and saying, <laughs> they were expressing their unhappiness about the fact that they couldn't find their collections on the web. So, just a little context. Um, this is a, a study that OCLC did in 2005 that many of you may have seen that uh, surveyed uh, college students and determined that 89% of college students start their research with internet search engines. That was a bit shocking, I think, in 2005, and I think a lot of people may have dismissed that statistic. You can see way down at the bottom of this chart is library websites with 2%. 2% uh, of college students were starting their research at library websites in 2005. It's pretty shocking, um, but it got worse. <laughs> 2010, OCLC did the study again, and this time they found that 83% of college students started their research with internet search engines as a discovery tool. But there were additional, so that number dropped a little bit, but there were addi additional uh, tools and, source, and sources that hadn't shown up in the 2005 study. So Wikipedia sh started showing up, social networking sites like, um, uh, like Facebook started to show up. And look at the library website. It dropped from 2% down to 0%. 0% of the people who were surveyed said that they did not start their research at the library website. Maybe they got there at some point, but that's not where they went first. So we have over the years as a profession put a lot of energy and a lot of resources into uh, the user experience for our websites, designing websites, doing uh, user testing. Um, I'd, I'd say we've pretty much lost that battle. It's not, we are never going to draw in people directly to our library websites um, the way search engines are drawing people in. So the real crux of this problem is data preparation. Are we feeding search engines the metadata that they can use to effectively steer people ultimately to our library websites? So um, in 1999, I um, became head of the um, digitization center, as it was called then, at the University of Utah's Marriott Library, and sort of launched the, um, the larger effort. There was some scanning going on of special collections materials before then, but it was being, they were being posted on static HTML sites. It wasn't a very scalable solution, and so, my team and I started to put databases in place and um, standards for metadata, and we, we started to develop the digital library on a larger scale. In about, I, th I think we always assumed that whatever we created, whatever we scanned and put up on the web was going to get picked up by search engines. Um, about 2008 or so, some, some cracks started to appear in that mindset when uh, especially my staff were saying to me, you know, I looked for this stuff and I just can't find it. Um, 
and if they as librarians couldn't find it, you know, you, you, you're pretty sure that uh, the most of the public couldn't find it. Um, so we started to look a little bit. We started to flail around, frankly, because we didn't really know what we were doing. And then about 2010, I met Patrick O'Brien, and Patrick is a, um, has a, a, a good background in um, econometrics, in um, search engine optimization for commercial uh, enterprises. Um, and he got really interested in why we were having this problem and started digging around. And for a while, he volunteered our, his services to us for about four months. Uh, in 2010, and then in uh, about September 2010, we hired him on contract for a year to see what he could do, to see if he could help us. And Patrick and I started to dig into this problem um, and put some baseline uh, numbers down. And, and I cannot emphasize enough the importance of putting down baselines. Figure out where you are, good or bad, and in this case, it was bad. <laughs> we found out that less than 12% of our digital collection content was accessible uh, through Google. And at that time, there were about 13 billion searches going on through Google every month by Americans, not even the rest of the world. 13 billion, and we were getting almost none of that traffic. Our institutional repository at the University of Utah was called uh, Uspace. And we figured out that less than 1% of the content that was in Uspace was, uh, was accessible through Google Scholar, which is the, the natural search engine. There is a real difference. There is an organizational and product difference between Google and Google Scholar. And Google Scholar is the natural target for content that's, put, that's in an IR, because it's academic research, and that's what they're looking for. So this was a shock. It was a huge shock to us. And then we wondered, of course, if it was just us. Uh, and we started looking around in the, the Mountain West Digital Library and beyond. Um, we started talking, giving presentations and talking to other librarians across the country, and pretty universally found out that it wasn't just us. Um, the numbers varied, of course, across the nation, but most library digital collections were not showing up in search engines the way they should have been. So, um, we started to work with Patrick about um, May uh, of 2010. July of 2010, we put these numbers into place. We found that the average indexing ratio um, of our digital collections in Google was about 12%. Um, then we looked at a subset of digital collections that had more than 500 URLs, and we found that the average high in, or the, the high indexing ratio for those collections was 37%. This was in July of 2010. By just doing some basic uh, legwork, uh, which was mostly IT focused, IT centered, um, fixing basic problems um, that we didn't know we had before Patrick came along, we were able to raise that to a 51% indexing ratio for an average uh, and a high for the, that subset of 87% by April of 2011, um, so almost a year later. And by November of that year, we were up to uh, almost 80% average indexing ratio and 100% for our high. So what we were doing was clearly having an effect and it was clearly driving traffic up so again, this is a different, a different view of it. Uh, this was for our ContentDM server. You can see pretty low traffic through um, about May of 2010, and then it started to steadily climb up uh, upward. And the result of that was more referrals from search engines and more visitors. So our um, visitation went up by 130%. You can see we went. This, this is a comparison of a 12-week period from 2010 with the same 12-week period in 2012, right? So that first column shows you that in 2010 we had about 52,000 visits for our, to our digital collections over that 12-week period, and in 2012 that went up to 120,000 visitors. Um, at the same time, uh, we increased the referrals that we got from all Google domains by 500%. You can see that down at the bottom right. So what we did, even in very basic terms, had dramatic effects and brought more people to our sites uh, because we were 
uh, more adeptly seeding those search engines, Google specifically. So the overall themes that we discovered in doing sort of this, this year or so of, of legwork are that traditional SEO, you know, making sure that the, um, the, the servers are optimized, that the software is optimized, that um, robots.txt files are not fighting with sitemaps, um, making sure that the uh, websites are navigable. That basic kind of stuff tends to be an afterthought in digital libraries. It's not something that people think about on the front end. We also found that librarians as a whole think too small about potential traffic. I mentioned the 13 billion searches that Americans do on Google every month. Well, that number is up closer to 20 billion now. And when we've talked to librarians um, and asked them about what kind of traffic they were getting and how they knew that their collections were being used, because this was one of the pushbacks we got. Oh, I know my collections are being used. So then the follow-up question was, how do you know? Oh, I, I get phone calls a couple of times a week um, from somebody asking about our, our collections. Okay, that's good, but that's really small thinking, okay? 19 billion visits to, or, or searches conducted in Google every month, and you're counting your numbers in, in two or three visitors a week. Um, the slice, our, our, our thinking could be much bigger. We found that organizational communication is poor, um, the classic example that I like to give is that even in my department, the IT department, we had a, a systems administrator sitting over here who was uh, setting up the robots.txt file. And the robots.txt file is basically a file on the server that says to search engine crawlers, okay, you can come into these directories, but you can't come into these directories. So he was setting that up over there. 20 feet away was a programmer who was submitting sitemaps to Google. And sitemaps are invitations to come into the digital collections, right? They, are, they say, here's our, our digital collection, and here are all the links in that digital collection. There are automated ways of setting this up. So the programmer was submitting the sitemap that said to Google, come on in, index this stuff, please. And the, and the systems administrator 20 feet away was putting up a robots.txt file said, said to search engines, no, no, you can't come in here. And so Google was going, you know, what do you want me to do here? Um, and so Google, when it runs search engine crawlers in general, when they run into contradictions or conflicts like that, they'll give up. They'll just walk away. They've got too much else to do. That's sort of anthropomorphizing it a little bit, but you know what I mean. They just leave. So organizational communication in general is poor, and it's not just in the IT department. It's the, the say that the special collections administrator, collection administrator has over how the collection appears and what kind of metadata it has. It's the metadata that the cataloging and processing and metadata departments put into place. It's the, it's the communication from, top, from on top, from library administrators uh, who are, A, know very little about this, and B, are not asking the questions about what kind of information that they need to report accurately out to their uh, uh, administrators. We found that metadata and repositories are often messy. Messy because uh, in many cases, we do too much rekeying. We type stuff over again that we shouldn't type over again. And when we type stuff, we um, make mistakes, right? And that, and that creates a mess, in, uh, especially in institutional repository metadata. There's no reason to retype a citation. You should be able to pull it in automatically from somewhere. Uh, and then analytics are usually poorly implemented. And analytics are the tools, often the free tools, that Google and other search engines put out there to say, use this to, to monitor what your digital collections are doing and to, and to figure out what your visitors to your digital collections are doing. And then vendors are slow to catch on to SEO problems. Were there software problems? Yes, there were software problems with ContentDM. Again, it was not the big problem. It was a part of the problem. There were also software problems with Primo from Ex Libris. So it took a while to talk to these vendors and say, look, you've got a real problem here. And again, you know, the pushback was, oh, really? We're not hearing this from anybody else. OK, we'll show you the numbers. And we showed them the numbers, and they went, oh. So it took 
years, and it's still going on. Those conversations are still going on with OCLC, with Ex Libris, with other vendors. DSpace had the same pro had had similar problems, um, and so things are getting better with software. But again, software is a small piece of the problem, and. In general, um, software tools don't exist to implement semantic web uh, SEO. It's a great idea to be able to pull in metadata from linked data sources. Most of our software doesn't allow us to do that yet, but that's why we have to put the pressure on software vendors to develop those capabilities. So um, let's move on to uh, the results of our research study. The most important thing is to figure out who your stakeholders are, what they want, and then to be able to measure what they want and what they value. Um, we have a tendency in this profession to be a little too insular. We build products for ourselves. Um, that was the case for a long time with ILSs. We built great Great catalogs, great inventory systems that worked really well for librarians, didn't work so well for um, the outside public. So let's just take two examples of stakeholders. For faculty whom you're trying to convince to put uh, materials into your institutional repository, the things that will make a difference to them is how many people come and look at their articles, how many people download their articles, and whether they get requests for, for more information, and ultimately, whether their work is being cited. Okay? If you can't help them do that, they're not going to be interested in participating in your institutional repository. Similar idea for collection donors. Um, they want to know whether, whether um, their, collection, their collections are even appearing in search engines. Um, they want to know whether people are visiting them, whether there, whether there are more requests for information, and whether any of that translates into physical visits to special collections or whether reproductions are, are being ordered. So we're used to thinking about library users, users as being our customers, but they are not our customers until search engines send them to us. Okay? Until then, they are the customers of those search engines. And search engines are not going to send their customers to a lousy experience. If you have slow servers, you have dead links, you have um, poor metadata, um, that's not a good search experience. That's not a good browse experience for your users. And search engines are not going to send their users uh, to places where they themselves have hard times collecting your information. So you put your, your collections into a content management system or into a digital asset management system, right, a CMS or a DAM. Um, you create this pipe that, that hopefully, uh, through search engines, gets your material to um, users. Ultimately, what you want to do is really fatten that pipe, and you want to make the case to those search engines, are you worthy enough for their customers? And how much will the customer value the introduction? So let's look at some traditional uh, search engine optimization risk areas. Um, there are administrative and organizational issues, some of those I've talked about a little bit already. SEO has to be driven from the top. It has to be driven from the library leadership team that sets the expectations and that demands the, the, the uh, response on metrics that they request. And it also demands response when things go wrong. Uh, and that's why it's so important to put tools in place those tools, again, are free. They're out there. Like Google Webmaster Tools is a monitoring tool that will tell you if search engine crawlers are having problems getting to your, um, to your site. And I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes. Um, descriptive uh, metadata uniqueness and structure. So it doesn't do any good. You have to think about search engines as being visually impaired users. Okay? They can't read images. They can't tell, if you, if, if, if you have 15 um, pictures of people on horses in your collection and every title uh, for your metadata says man on horse or woman on horse, 
A search engine crawler is going to go through the first half dozen of those and say, this stuff is all the same. They can't tell that the pictures are different. So your metadata has to be unique for each image. Um, and then the structure. We'll talk in a few minutes about um, Dublin Core and its weaknesses um, and how the, the semantic web techniques that are being put in place now establish, do a better job of establishing context around metadata. Metadata right now is flat. Okay? It's one dimensional and it's flat. You have one term to describe uh, uh, an item. I mean, you have multiple terms, but the terms themselves are, are singular terms. Search engine policies and practices change. It was a shock to librarians when in 2008, Google said, we're not doing OAI anymore. We're not harvesting from digital collections using the Open Archives Initiative uh, protocol for metadata harvesting. We're just not going to do it. And yet every database, every, every digital asset management system that libra libraries use offered up data through OAI PMH. Well, Google's the elephant in the room. You know, if they say they're not going to honor OAI anymore, it's not much that we can do about it. Um, but we have to be aware of those changes and we have to figure out alternatives. Um, at some point, Google Scholar said, we don't care about Dublin Core. Dublin Core is useless to us. Those are the kinds of policies that you have to monitor, you have to watch out for, and you have to adjust along the way. And then, of course, we talked a little bit about server configuration and performance. Um, it, it's no good for users or search engines if your sites are slow and if you're not delivering a good experience. So this is from the lowest level, <clears throat> the web server level, then the application level, then the presentation layer. The presentation layer would be the website. Those are really the technical uh, aspects, um, mostly technical. But descriptive metadata is the, is the biggest, I think, the biggest part of this. Um, structuring metadata appropriately and uniquely is the biggest issue in um, working well with search engines. So here's an example of um, Webmaster Tools, a, a, a little screenshot from Google Webmaster Tools. Um, it tells you a lot about how, your, um, how the experience that search engine crawlers have when they get to your server. Okay? So if you look at this particular, uh, these snippets um, from Google Webmaster Tools, You'll see that, that first orange box, it says, uh, it gives an error message of uh, that it was restricted, it had 61,467 um, URLs that were restricted, were restricted by the robots.txt file. Okay, this is the example I gave you earlier. So we, you know, the, the, the question is, what, what is your systems administrator doing about this? Our systems administrator was sitting there going, huh, yeah, look at that, okay, next and wasn't reacting, wasn't doing anything about it. And that's because there wasn't enough, and, and that's my fault at the time too, there wasn't enough knowledge from the top to say, what are you doing about those problems? And then the same thing with the graph. That, that little orange highlighted uh, spot is a bad spot. This shows you um, the, the reaction in seconds uh, of our server. And I don't know how well you can see, but there's a bottom row uh, that's in a light green. That's the one second or less response from servers. You can see we're not there at all. And our, our um, performance was hovering somewhere in the three seconds. So someone would click on a, on a link, and it would take three seconds before they got a, a result back. As far as search engines go, that's not good. And um, I'm sorry, so the orange box is very good. It, it, went, it went close to the one second uh, line for a short period, but then it started to climb back up. Again, what's going on here? What, what are your systems administrators doing to address these errors, these problems? The tools are there. How we react to them, how we use them to make user um, experience better, that's the question. So here's another uh, thing that we did. Um, uh, when we were up at the, up at the Marriott Library, um, we consolidated all of our, we had web analytics set up for individual servers, and then we were trying to put together 
numbers based on different reports. So we were using something called Web Trends, and we had a Web Trends profile set up for the Content DM server, another Web Trends profile set up for the, the main library website, another Web Trends server set up for the IR. And we were trying to piece together all of these numbers, and it just wasn't working very well. Um, and so what we did was, uh, and, and this is a huge problem. In fact, this, is, this has opened up sort of another area of our research. Libraries across the country are doing this, are doing it that way. And what they really should be doing is configuring Web Trends or Google Analytics to look across all the properties. Because if you're not looking across all of the properties, you can't follow users as they jump from one server or one site to another. So we have some, some basic recommendations um, that we have uh, written about and presented about institutionalizing SEO making sure that the leadership of the, of the institution knows what to ask for and how this can help in their reports to, to their administrators. Um, so accurate measurement tools, driving this from the strategic plan. I'll tell you, SEO is not in the strategic plan of the vast majority of libraries. It is, it is now at um, Marriott and it is at, at Montana State too. Um, traditional SEO, is just making sure that your stuff is showing up in Google in, in search engine indexes. So getting indexed, improving your indexing ratio. And the indexing ratio is just the number of um, URLs to your digital collections that show up in the search engine index versus what you've submitted to them. Okay. Um, and then getting visible on the search engine results page. It's one thing to show up on an index, in, in an index, it's another thing to show up in the first or second page of results, okay? It doesn't do much good at all if you're way back uh, on, on page five or page 10. Nobody goes there. It's like it's the retail equivalent of being on the, 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 in the back of the store or out in the warehouse, you know? You need to be up front. And then where semantic uh, SEO is taking us is on those uh, click-through ratios, semantic web, uh, techniques have shown the ability to, okay, you, you're, you're, you're in the index, you're being shown on page one or two, but are people clicking on you? Are people clicking on that link to go to your site? And what makes that happen is the, is the description that they see underneath uh, the link. It's, it's what shows up in Google's knowledge graph now on the right side. You know, is there a map? Is there some additional information? Semantic techniques can make that happen. Okay, so for the user experience, uh, again, just some very general recommendations. Uh, make sure you focus on uh, descriptive page titles. If every, one of your, uh, if every one of your page titles is the same, and this is a common problem with digital asset management systems because they work on templates, right? So every template will have the same title unless you do something specific to make sure that it pulls in metadata from the item it's displaying. Um, External linking, the more inbound uh, links that you have to your site from external sites, uh, the more link juice you'll get from uh, search engines. Uh, easy and intuitive site navigation, uh, and then the, the site maps and robots.txt file again. Monitoring, um, making sure that everyone in the library who has a stake in this, and that should be almost everybody, uh, has some ownership over it. Making sure you're using the latest software and then optimizing web server performance. So our IMLS grant had certain deliverables or has certain deliverables written into it. The first is that we simply expand our research and we've, we've done that almost since the beginning. The second is to publish a toolkit with our recommendations. I just showed you a few of them. Um, to also create some tools that are easily plug and play for monitoring and reporting. Um, metadata transformation mechanisms, because we're all stuck with the metadata that we have, right? How do we change it to something that, that's useful for search engines? Figuring out how to do that in an automated way will go over um, much better than asking people to do it manually. Um, and then disseminating findings through papers, conference presentations, and webinar training sessions. So this is an example of one of the tools that we've created. It's almost ready for release. Um, this is a Google Analytics dashboard, basically, that should be pretty much plug and play for other institutions. This, this um, is set up to report 
some of the, the more useful metrics uh, for funding agencies. These are some of, the, some of our publications, um, the oldest on the bottom, Invisible Institutional Repositories, uh, was, was I think pretty groundbreaking and, and caused a lot of conversation about IRs and why they're not showing up in search engines. Um, and then there's a, a book in there somewhere, uh, the third bullet is the, the book that we wrote. And then we just mo most recently submitted uh, another article to the Journal of Library Administration, which deals specifically with the management and leadership issues of SEO. So the research has gotten very interesting and has gone off in numerous directions. Like I said, when I started this, I thought it was just gonna be a, a purely technical problem. It's gone off in numerous directions. So one of the things that we've discovered is um, because everybody uses these analytics services how many of you are ARL members? You. University of Utah, of course. So for years, we were reporting to ARL our website statistics. And I was partially responsible for collecting some of those statistics. Um, and I would look at those numbers, and I would see the numbers that were being submitted by our sister libraries on campus uh, and thinking, how can this be? How can the Eccles Library be, have, have two, three times the number of visitors that we're having? And we would, you know, I'd call up the Eccles Library and talk to Nancy Lombardo and, and she said, well, you know, that's, that's what the numbers are showing. We're, we're just getting more visitors than you are. <laughs> So what we found out, there are basically two ways to count visitors. Right? You can use an analytics service like Web Trends or Google Analytics, or there are a number of others out there, and they use what's called page tagging. There's a little bit of HTML, uh, JavaScript code on each HTML page that a search engine crawler, or that a search engine counts when somebody clicks through. Or sorry, that, that, that Google Analytics, that the software counts when somebody clicks onto it. The other way is to use log files, and these are just server-based log files. This is what systems administrators typically uh, get into. And there are problems, it turns out, with both of those met methods. Because the, the little bit of code is on the HTML page, if you've ever gone to Google Scholar and you bring up a set of results, you'll, you'll notice that there's a, there are links off to the right that say, click on you know, PDF. Uh, at this site. If you click on that link, you'll be taken directly to the PDF document, bypassing that HTML page that has the metadata and that has the page tagging code on it. That click did not get counted. That click turns out to be significant, um, as in hundreds of, of clicks, depending on how much traffic you get, but in University of Utah's case, hundreds of clicks uh, downloads each week that are not being counted. So there's a huge problem of underreporting. Log files, the opposite problem is often the case. You have to set things up really carefully to screen out all those crawlers, all those spiders, all those robots who come constantly hitting a, a, a server. If you don't screen those out, you know, you're, reporting, you're reporting way more visitors than you're actually getting. So here's another lesson um, from our, our research, another, another area that you know, was just totally off the radar at the beginning. Digital collections. It's a phrase that we use to describe what we put up there, right? Nobody searches on digital collections. Nobody uses that phrase. Again, Google comes to the rescue with these wonderful tools, a keyword search tool that tells you how many searches are being done on each particular um, uh, phrase. Now, this is not a one-to-one -one example here, but you can see how many people are searching on digital library, 2400 versus digital repository, 140. So it has this tool called the keyword analysis tool that can help you assess how certain words or phrases may rank within a search. 
And then they also rank the competition for that search as low, medium, or high. You can see digital library is a medium um, uh, phrase. What you want to do is, is use this tool to figure out what phrases, what words, to put on your websites that Google will harvest and that users will search. You have to figure out how to make that match between what users are searching and what you're presenting. You present digital repository or digital collections, you're not going to get very many hits because nobody's searching on that stuff. But if you use digital library, you're going to get a lot more results. What you don't want to do is use a keyword phrase that has very high competition uh, because that means a lot of sites are, are using that. You want to look for the sites that are relevant, uh, sorry, the phrases that are relevant, um, but that are also medium to low competition. So here's another example. Uh, institutional repository, academic research, research papers, and open access library. We as librarians, of course, like to use the word uh, or the phrase institutional repository. Well, guess what? Again, nobody uses that, right? So let's see, institutional repository, only 210 searches uh, in, in every, any average month. Research papers, on the other hand, 3,600 searches over a month. So customize your, your keywords, your phrases that you put on your websites to match what users are searching for, and this tool will help you do it. It's the Google Keyword Analysis Tool. OK, so let's get into the semantic web. <clears throat> One of the things that we found when we first started doing our um, research is that we had don't look at the title yet, look at the, the graph. We had, for the institutional repository use space, we had very um, low penetration in uh, Google. Um, we had four collections that we looked at, ETDs, of course, like electronic theses and dissertations, 12% indexing ratio for that, um, zero for a second, but that was because it had just started. Um, the main IR collection was called U Scholar Works, 23%. Uh, indexing ratio, and this is Google, this is Google okay, just the, the main Google search uh, index. So over time, we were able to bring that up, right? This is uh, the first uh, set of numbers was July 2010, then uh, November 2010, and then by um, October of 2011, we had an, we'd done a good job. We had an average indexing ratio of our institutional repository of 98% in Google but we were still at zero in Google Scholar. So we're scratching our heads, why is this? Why? It was really frustrating. The problem, it turns out, is that we are creating too much metadata that's human readable. We're creating metadata for humans, just like we've done for the last 50, 100 years. We're not creating metadata that's good enough for machines. We're not creating metadata that's readable and comprehensible by machines. So here's a typical citation for an article, right? This is how the citation was appearing in our Dublin Core source field for in, in, in use space, okay? Just the whole thing dumped into one single metadata field. Google Scholar doesn't know what to do with it. What does Google Scholar want to do for its users? What does it want to deliver besides the papers themselves? citations, right? It wants you to be easily able to download a citation in any style format that you want, whether you want APA or Chicago or Turabian or whatever it is. It can't do that with this because it doesn't know what the different parts of the citation are. It's a, it's a machine. What it wants is something that looks more like this. This is not Dublin Core. Google Scholar has said explicitly, use Dublin Core only as a last resort okay? because of this problem. Because of this problem and because uh, we tend to not use Dublin Core in a very consistent manner. So what it wants instead is um, one of four schemas that it recommends, Highwire Press, Prism, um, B Press, or ePrints. Those are the four schemas that it recommends. So this one is high wire press. So we've taken that same citation and we've divided it up into parsable chunks uh, using high wire press. Now, suddenly Google Scholar knows what to do with it. So initially we had less than 1% 
of 8,000 scholarly papers in the Google Scholar Index. We did some pilot tests. Um, for the first pilot test, we tried 19 papers, and we tried to work with Dublin Core. We tried to use something called Dub Dublin Core Terms, which some people have gotten to work, but we couldn't get it to work. Doesn't mean it won't work, just means we couldn't get it to work. Then we tried a second test with the, um, the high wire press example that I just showed you, and we got up to 62% indexing ratio. Then we had a network failure and a power failure, and Google Scholar said, and because Google Scholar, we were talking to them directly, and they were saying, you know, what's up with you, you guys amateurs? You know, your server's down. So we had to start again. This time we did 56 papers, and we hit 90% indexing ratio. So it can be done. Right? It can be done. You just have to know how to do it. And the important thing now, and what we're working really hard on at Montana State University, is, is figuring out citation parsing software that will take existing citations that are in Dublin Core fields all across the country and parsing them out into their discrete portions. We're hitting about 70 to 75 percent accuracy at the moment. Um, it's not perfect. It's not going to be perfect because there are so many inconsistencies in the way people put citations into fields. But hey, 75% is way better than 0%, isn't it? I mean, if, if, we, can, if we can automatically transform 75% of existing metadata into the right um, format, and then maybe you'll have to do some manually, that's, that's a big deal. Um, okay. So, um, so now we're at the point where Google Scholar is happy, right? Google Scholar can read and understand what we've put up. It allows people to cite um, the materials that we've put in there in, in the format that they want to. However, uh, Google, Google, the big Google, still can't understand or read any of our structured data. Our papers are getting into Google but it's not taking advantage of any of the high wire press. Why? They're separate organizations. However, Google um, has agreed with several other search engines to support something called schema.org. And this schema.org is a, uh, a way of providing that semantic context to metadata. So let's talk a little bit about why semantic search is useful. Uh, it's already being used in, in a lot of, this is how search engines and some applications are figuring out what you really want. The greatest analogy I've ever heard about search engines and why they're so, such a problem is we expect too much from them, from them. It's like going up to a perfect stranger saying two words, Paris Hilton, and expecting a response. That's what we're expecting right now from search engines. So do you mean the Hilton in Paris? Do you mean the actress? Do you mean Paris, Texas? The search engine doesn't know. Google has actually done remarkably well with delivering results based on how little information they have to work with. And Google has said the biggest problem that they face is poor metadata. So. If we start to employ structured metadata, and we start to employ, uh, sorry, new, new forms of structured metadata, and we start to employ um, semantic web techniques like schema.org, there's already evidence that it helps with click-through rates because now search engines can deliver more accurate results and users can see that the results that they have in the search engine results page are actually what they want versus going to a site and then figuring out that's not what they wanted. So the click-through rates increase um, and organic traffic increases. I'm, I'm just going to blow through this pretty quickly, but basically semantic um, search um, helps us to understand context. Is that Mustang that you're asking for a horse, a car, a uh, sports team, whatever? Is it, what is it? Providing that semantic metadata helps the search engine understand what you really have. So the four major search engines, uh, Google, uh, Bing, Yahoo, and Yandex, which is the Russian search, engines have, search engine, have all agreed to support schema.org. And so 
the keys are to make the metadata search engine understandable and readable. And there you can see we're up to uh, 19 billion queries per month for these uh, four search engines. And the problem is still, we're getting there, we're getting there, right? But we need to put more pressure on our vendors to develop these solutions more quickly for us. Because industry is way ahead of us in this, in this regard. So real fast, um, because I'm running out of time, uh, this, is, this is an example of, um, of what semantic uh, search can do. So here's a typical search engine uh, result, right? Historic landmarks in Denver was the search. You get some results. OK, that's nice. But if you have semantic um, metadata, then it, and it helps the search engine anticipate what you're actually looking for. The search engine wants to know why would someone search for historic landmarks in Denver? Are they traveling? Um, what, what's the reason? And having more rich metadata allows it to produce these kinds of results so that not only do you get a set of links, but you get a set of addresses, you get a, a, a map, you even get, in many cases, some additional rich information, some images, um, some recommend, uh, reviews, um, hours, all kinds of stuff that flat metadata cannot provide. Okay? This is Google's knowledge graph, and this is, this is where we're going. So where does all the information come from? You've probably seen this before, right? This is, the, uh, this is linked open data. This is the linked um, open data web. Um, we should be focusing on figuring out not only how to use those linked open data sources in an automated way, but also to help build them, help create them. So let me show you what I mean. What do you guys all think of Wikipedia? All right, one. I like it too. I think this is a place where librarians are, as a whole, on the wrong side of history. If you try, if you go out and you Google uh, Wikipedia authoritative source, you will find, you will be amazed at how much energy and time librarians have spent on tearing Wikipedia down saying it's not the place where you should do your research. Maybe it's the place where you can start, OK. Um, it's caused us to separate from Wikipedia. Just like years ago, I, I mean, I'm sure it still goes on. We're, we're, we've, we've, we used to teach, and we, I'm sure we're still teaching, that Google is not the place you should go to start your research or to do your research, right? Well, guess what? We're losing that battle. That's, then you've seen the numbers. So when I came to Montana State University last year, sometime after I got there, I did a search in Google for Montana State University Library. And this is what came up. Where is Montana State University? This says it's in Billings. Yeah, so I was sitting in there in Bozeman going, what? Did I, did I report to the right library? Why did, why did this happen? Why do you suppose it happened? It happened in part because nobody had claimed the property in Google+. Nobody had written an article about the MSU library in Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not just a source for information. This is really important. Wikipedia is a place that authoritatively establishes an entity's existence. As far as search engines are concerned, if you don't exist in Wikipedia, you don't exist. Okay? And that's what happened. Google did the best it could because it couldn't find any information about MSU Library in Bozeman. And so it, it found what, whatever it could find. And it started telling people that we were in Billings. There is an MSU campus in Billings, of course. but. It's not the, the flagship campus. So we've remedied that. We created a Wikipedia article. It was hard. 
it's, not actu it's actually not easy to write a Wikipedia article. There are lots of rules, and there are lots of checks and balances. It is a peer-reviewed source. And it took months. It took months for us to write this Wikipedia article. But a few weeks after we got it up there, boom, this started showing up correctly. And once you're an entity in a search engine, that opens up all kinds of doors. Okay, so let's, let's summarize quickly. Um, why, I think I've, I've pretty much made the case um, about why I think this is an important uh, leadership issue, why SEO is, is important for leadership and for management, and why it's not just a technical issue. Um, I, you know, before I moved to, um, or before I started doing this research, I spent 10 years um, building digital libraries and with Cheryl, and I know you had a presentation from Cheryl and Catherine and Sandra yesterday about the Mountain West Digital Library. That was something that we launched back in 2002. Um, other big ones, the Utah Digital Newspapers, the Western Waters Digital Library, and the Western Soundscape Archive. These were all projects that I was very proud of. Um, so it was really irritating uh, and, and disconcerting to, to, see, uh, to see the, the results of those projects not showing up in search engines. And, and beside that emotional issue, you know, I have to, as an administrator, I have to really answer the question, were they effective and were they being used? So it's really important to um, establish uh, accountability at the institutional level. This is essentially a data problem and a leadership slash management problem. IT techniques, as I've said, do of course play into it. And if you search the literature, you'll find it mostly discussing IT aspects. But in my opinion, it's a minority of the problem. It's a data problem because the metadata we create are still mostly focused on human readability instead of machine readability, and because we do too much rekeying, which introduces errors. We should be using DOIs and linked data sources to import metadata, and we should be creating linked data sources for other others to use. And it's a leadership management problem because you can't solve this problem without the entire organization having some understanding and some role. There are very few library leaders out there who understand SEO and the semantic web at this point. I didn't understand it before I started to, to do this research. Uh, and that's what we're working on changing. So, um, oh, sorry. I just have to say something about the second bullet. Uh, avoid the free-for-all silos. Programmers are wonderful. But programmers have a hammer in their hand. And to them, everything looks like a nail, right? And they will say, oh yeah, I can build that. I can build you this, I can build you that. The, the road behind us is littered with tools that were built at individual institutions that had no connection to other institutions, to developments in the, in the library world. Um, and, and I mean, I, I shudder to think of how much grant money and how much institutional money has been spent on building tools that are not scalable and don't integrate with um, the rest of the profession. So be careful of that. Um, and then just more about why, why this fits into leadership, why this is so important. Um, if you're at an academic institution, um, you're, you're, you're expected to do research. Uh, you're expected to contribute to the profession. Um, so that means getting funding, getting grants, doing the work, getting results, and then publishing the results of that work. And if you're not at an academic institution, institution I hope you don't let that hold you back. I mean, you, you, you know, you really, it, doing research is exciting and it's interesting and it's, it's very rewarding um, to see your work uh, published. And it's uh, a leadership issue because of the organizational issue. We've talked about this already. Most library staffs are not prepared for this particular work. Um, and it's, it's a leadership issue to get them educated and to uh, make them understand why this, or help them to understand why this is so important. And then the broader impact on the profession. Thank you. <laughs>